This morning, I'd like to talk to you about God's sovereign providence and protection. Because both of those things were part of this little snapshot in life, this trip that I took. And I believe God used it to, to shape something inside of me. So I'd like to share that with you guys today. So would you bow with me in prayer before we get into the word today? Lord Jesus, we, we give you glory. They cried, Hosanna, Lord, when you, brought, when you were brought into the city riding on the donkey's colt. And they laid palm branches before you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Lord, we bless you today because you come to us, Lord, today in a way to, to help us to navigate the life that you've given us to live. And Lord, we thank you that you speak to us very clearly through your word. So God, I just pray that what I say today would be honoring to you and would be true to the text that your word is speaking this morning as we go through the different scripture verses, Lord, that hearts would be encouraged and strengthened and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of Jesus, amen. So sometimes on our life's journey, we're confronted with unexpected, uh, how would you say it, difficulties along the way. None of us are exempt, and these things can sometimes be fairly significant, and they can cause us to question whether or not God knows what's taking place. And there's that deep-seated doubt when we come to circumstances, and we ask God, are, are you really in control? And that's the natural doubt inside of our, our, our humanness, our sinful man. But in the pain and the shock of what we see happening, we can have this tendency to ask God whether he cares about what's happening to us. And sometimes we feel pretty small. Sometimes we feel like, Am I, I'm just a piece of dust. And, and that's true, we are. But I want you to know God holds very great value for every man, woman, and child that he's created. And when we enter a season or experience an event like this that I'm talking about that causes us to question, the Bible has very much to say about the providence of God in the midst of our brokenness. And one thing is for certain. One thing's for certain. When we look at the Bible, God is in control. The Bible tells us that he is sovereign over all things. As a matter of fact, in the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 31, it is written, Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. It's also written in the very last book of the Bible in Revelation chapter 411. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The bottom line is this. There is absolutely nothing that happens in the universe outside of God's influence and authority. Did you know that? Absolutely nothing. As King of kings and Lord of lords over all of creation, God has zero, no limitations. It's written in Daniel chapter 435. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now there's a story that's written in the scriptures that illustrates the sovereign guidance of God over the affairs of men. And I'd like to discuss this with you briefly. 
kind of as a backdrop to where I'm going this morning. It's in a parable that was told by Jesus, and it's found in the book of Luke. If you've got your Bibles, if you turn to Luke chapter 12, 16 to 21. Now, this particular parable in Luke 12, 16 to 21, has most often been taken into context as a warning from an unbeliever's perspective, which it is. But there is also primary lessons to be learned through this passage on the flip side that are meant to encourage believers to trust in the sovereign guidance and provision of God. So when we read this, we hear hear this being said in this parable. Jesus said this, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Now, when I look at the story, when you look at what it's saying, according to the story, and we know it to be true, there are seasons of life that are not always difficult. Each of us has had these seasons in our lives. There's times where things go pretty well, right? We like to use the word, they're going tickety-boo, kind of as a cultural phrase, going well. Like the rich man in the parable told by Jesus, many people have experienced abundance with the circumstances that they find themselves in. And the natural conditions sometimes are right to make a great deal of money and to live a life in luxury. And there are times when the rain falls and the sun shines in life just at the right time, no matter what your occupations. And there's a bumper crop at the harvest time. Now, this parable Jesus told uses a rich farmer as an example in in this circumstance, but it's not just a parable about rich farmers receiving a good harvest. It's about attitudes when things are going really well. In the case of the rich farmer, the conditions were just right, and the plants of his field yielded a, a great crop And the harvest was so great that the farmer thought that he would increase the size of his barns to store up this crop and retire early in comfort because the wealth generated from this huge, amazing crop would last for many years. But the issue is this. In this parable, the issue is that the farmer was not thankful to God for what he had received. He was happy with his provisions, very happy, assuming that his, his take was a stroke of good fortune, maybe, or the result somewhat of his own efforts in preparing the ground and a combination of that, maybe. This man was very proud. He was a haughty-spirited man, a godless man. His thought was that all he had to do was make a few plans to preserve his own life on the earth and build an empire for himself, and it would all come together. But in this parable, we see that God confronts this man's arrogant stance, as if to say, who do you think you are? Do you think that you are in full control of your own destiny? Do you not know that all I have to do is speak one word and your life could be taken away from you? The truth is for every man, woman, and child in this world, 
We do not know when we will breathe our last breath here on the earth. We cannot predict the things as they go, whether they will go well, or when they will be difficult. There are times when God in his sovereignty will permit goodness to flow like a river through our lives. And then there is times where every waking breath is a struggle and there is trouble on every corner. Solomon, the wisest man, tried to make sense of this and in his own human wisdom, he couldn't. He was the wisest man ever to live and he was confounded by this issue. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 15, as a matter of fact, he said, In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that anyone can do to add a day to our lives. Our days are numbered. God knows the number of our days, and there's nothing we can do to avert this. God understands the end from the beginning. He is sovereign over all things. So on the flip side of this parable, the lesson that we as believers in Jesus Christ can take away is that we are called to be rich toward our God during the days that we live. We've been granted a way to know the everlasting God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a sacrifice that we might become the sons and daughters of the Most High, cleansed by his blood, our sins forgiven, and brought into his presence as his children. We've been granted this by his grace. Because of this, as his children, God desires that his children learn to trust him as a heavenly father who has his children's eternal best interest in mind. He knows what's best for us. We might not always see it, and sometimes we might question it because of the circumstances that we face, but he always has our best interest in mind. And what this means is that there is a call for believers, you and me, to live our lives humbly before him, understanding what James says in James chapter 4, 13 to 16. James says this, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to, do, to this city or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is evil. So, here we come to the story of what God taught me on my journey. I told you already that there was a time a couple weeks ago that I just found that I needed to get away and have quiet, or I needed to hear the voice of God without any distractions. Yeah, I went hunting. That's a provisionary thing. I mean, my family has done it for generations. My family has put food on the table by hunting. It's just part of who I am. I was raised that way from that high all the way to where I am today. But my primary goal in going away was to hear from God. You see, 
I made preparations. I packed my trailer. I packed my utility trailer. I had a quad. I had a canoe. I had a generator. I had a, a cart that I towed behind my quad and lots of fuel to be able to navigate through the wilderness. And I got a camper on the back of my truck and I, told, I got everything ready. I put new tires on my truck for the winter and I thought, this is great. I'll torque them. And I torqued those wheels down so that they wouldn't budge. I, everything was ready everything was prepared and I went but because I had so much preparation and I had to work the day before I didn't get away exactly when I wanted to I got away a little later in the afternoon so as it necessitated I couldn't make it to where my destination was by nightfall and I didn't really want to drive the highways during the late hours of the night so between Prince George and Mackenzie there's this rest stop so I pulled off to the side of the road at this rest stop. And I looked around and there's lots of vehicles crowded into that rest stop. And I it was a little bit uneasy because I had stuff in my trailer that could be lifted, but I, I was really tired actually from all the preparation and having worked the week before hard and I was tired. So I went into my camper to get a few hours of sleep and I hit the pillow and I was out like a light. Slept well. Morning came, I woke up. Ah, huh, okay, nice day. Might as well get back on the road. So I jumped in my truck and I started riding. And um, I got all the way through the, uh, the Peace River area up to Fort St. John and I started going north. My, my goal was there's a certain place up north beyond Fort St. John that I had scoped out on the maps and that's where I was going to make my camp. And I had a plan. Well, so much of the plans of men. I was an hour and a half north of Fort St. John, driving on the Alaska Highway at full highway speed. And all of a sudden, I felt something weird shift in my vehicle. And um, I thought, well, it's kind of a straight stretch. There's no shoulder to pull over here. The next place I can find, maybe I'll pull over and check and just make sure everything's okay. I didn't have time to do that because no sooner had I thought this, just after that, there's this transport truck fully loaded, a B-train loaded with oil, two tankers behind this B-train coming for me from, from, the, from the north to the south, heading towards the refineries, I'm, I'm assuming. And all of a sudden, bang! My, the back of my vehicle dropped onto the highway. My rear driver's side tire went flying. And I didn't realize what was happening at the time. I didn't know what was happening because my eyes were ahead. But bang, my whole rig shifted and, and I started to jackknife and crossing towards this transport truck, I'm trying to steer back to avoid jackknifing and going right into him. And if I would have hit that transport truck, I would have been like a bug on the windshield. It was fully, I'm sure it was fully loaded. I didn't even have time to cry out to God. I didn't have time for anything except to grab the steering wheel and try and steer and stop. And that transport missed me. I don't know how close. It was a hair that I got missed. And I managed to pull this thing straight. And the guy behind me saw it all happen and I pulled off and I looked. And I got eight spoke wheels and all of them were torqued. I know, because I did it before I left. Someone had undone and sabotaged my rear driver's side wheel. They had undone the lug nuts. The reason I knew this is because I had torqued it and eight nuts were completely gone. My rim was rounded out around the hole so it had been rattling for a while. Someone had sabotaged me. Someone saw my rig and thought I was going hunting, and they didn't agree with my lifestyle choice, I'm sure of it, at that, probably at that rest stop overnight. And they sabotaged me. They sabotaged me. As it turns out, I ended up getting a tow into Fort St. John and ended up taking two days out of my, my journey to, to fix my truck. And it all worked out. I got all the parts and got it fixed. And I was alive. My, my plans were changed, and um, 
You know, it, it, I'm, I'm asking myself, okay, like, God, what, what is going on here? I, I'm here to get away, to relax, and to hear from you. And he's like, yeah, listen. Do you know that sometimes on the road of life, people will want to sabotage you? What did they do to my apostles? They sabotaged my apostles along the way. Every believer that wants to follow Jesus Christ experiences sabotage at some point. For whatever reason, not everyone is going to like who we are, what we decide to stand for, what we say. And the thing about sabotage is that you have absolutely zero control over the other person's actions, attitudes, or motivations for doing what they've done to you. There's no doubt in our lives we may come into times where someone will want to hurt or sabotage us. It might not make any sense. Sabotage can come from the outside with people unknown to us like it happened to me. I don't know if they're Greenpeace. or what. I don't know who these people were that did this. But they didn't like my hunting rig. And they did it. Paul and the other apostles knew sabotage from outside of the believer circle, but they also knew it from inside. And they had to suffer through it. For me, I was on a hunting trip and a trip to inquire of God for vision and direction. And some people don't understand the hunting lifestyle. I get that. They don't, they don't understand. I'm out there for provisionary purpose. And I'm out there to hear from the Lord in the wilderness, which I connect very well to. That's where God often speaks to me. It's part of my culture. I was on a journey. But at the rest stop that night, other people on different journeys of their own intersected my path. And for whatever reason, this person wanted to stop me on my journey and they made it their business to interfere with my journey to try and spoil the plants. They made me their enemy, not even knowing me, and attacked me on the sly. Sabotage. Have you ever been sabotaged? Have you ever been maligned? Attacked? You don't even understand what, why? Well, sometimes we understand why. On the topic of sabotage, what can be done about sabotage? Can we do anything about sabotage? Like a person that sneaks up on your vehicle at night. We can't control or predict what people will do to us. What they did endangered my life. They didn't know my story, who I was, or what my purposes were. They just knew what they could see on the super surface, and I was their enemy. So after giving this some long thought, um, you know, God's created each of us individually. He's created us in his image. He looks at us with love. And he says, what I have formed is good. Each of us is different. We can't stop being who we are. He's made us the way we are. And spiritually speaking, physically speaking, spiritually speaking, we cannot live, we cannot afford to live in constant fear knowing that someone might hit us who does not like us or what we stand for. You know, God wants us to be wise and yeah, you don't put yourself into a scenario where you know that like, you know, I'm not going to go to an anti-hunting club with my camouflage and sit down and go, what's your problem, boys? I'm not going to do that. That's not wise, Right? So, after giving this thought, I started thinking about this. It, you see, it's God's design that no matter what happens tomorrow, whether in good stead or in trouble, that we continue to honor Jesus in our lives, regardless of whether we get sabotaged or not. God in the end, has the ultimate say in how things are going to go down, even when someone tries to hurt us. You know that? There's nothing that's going to happen to us unless God permits it. David understood this. this. <coughs> Pardon me. Could I get someone to get me a 
glass of water. Unlike the man in the parable who thought that he controlled the outcomes, David understood that God is the ultimate decider on how things go. Nobody is going to harm us or kill us or do anything to us unless God has decreed that it is permitted. And when our mission in this realm is finished, in this life, thank you, Kim. When our mission is finished, you and I are going to meet Jesus face to face. There's nothing that's going to sidestep that. We all have an appointment. Consider the 13th Psalm. Um, David prayed in this Psalm. He didn't really understand what was happening to him or why God was permitting him to go through what he had to go through. But he knew that the Lord had an ultimate plan for him. In the meantime, he was pursued, troubled, and chased around by his enemies. David longed for closeness with his father in the midst of the test that he was enduring. He was so human in, in this psalm, just like us. So human. It's, it's just, he cried out to God. He said, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I will overcome him. And my foe will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Oh man, you see that hum? The difference between David's approach to this and the man who stored up the grain in his, and wanted to get more barns? David understood that absolutely everything in his life was revolving around the will and sovereignty of God. <laughs> Ultimately, when someone is trying to harm us, whether, we know, whether or not we know the person who's trying to sabotage our journey, it's the Lord's will for us to have the attitude of Jesus Christ towards the circumstance. So how do we react when we have someone that tries to sabotage us? Jesus prayed for mercy concerning those who were out to try and harm him. When the enemies of Christ were crucifying him, what did he say? What did he cry out to the Father? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So Stephen, the first martyr of the church, when they had gathered around him, now Stephen was in the position of being martyred because he confronted the religious leaders of his day and told them that they were wrong and that they were out, out of step with God's purposes. That's why. They gnashed their teeth at him. They were so angry. How dare you confront the religious status quo of the day? How dare you step on our toes? As a matter of fact, you're talking about this Jesus and it's blasphemy. And who was there giving approval to his death? Saul of Tarsus. And as the stones came crashing down on Stephen's head, the sky opened and he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And what did he say to the Lord? He didn't say, Jesus, I'm coming home. You know, get your smoldering lightning bolts and fry these suckers. No, that, that, that wasn't his response. His response was this, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. <laughs> he's got stones crashing down on his head. And he's saying, Lord, don't hold the sin against them. He's concerned about them. He's not concerned about his own life. He knows where he's going. He's concerned about the ones that are hurting him. And you know, God answered his prayer because the one that was the ringleader of that group was Saul of Tarsus. And we know that he became Paul the Apostle, the chief apostle to the Gentiles of the church. In answer to Stephen's prayer, God did not hold this grievous sin against Paul. 
but gave him grace and mercy. (laughs) Stephen understood that many of his persecutors were oblivious to the fact that they were resisting the Holy Spirit. He knew they were acting out of rage in their flesh without spiritual insight. And they thought they were doing the right thing, as a matter of fact, in their malicious actions against him, making him their enemy, right? Stephen had the attitude of Christ who gave this command in Luke chapter 26, 27 to 29. He says this, Jesus Jesus says this, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. There's people that are going to make enemies out of us even when we don't deserve it. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. God, that person that sabotaged me, I pray that you would save them. I pray that you would speak to them and and teach them your ways. That somehow you would intersect their life and that they would learn who they are before you and they would bow their knee to you, Lord. Have mercy on them, Lord. We don't deserve God's grace. None of us do. At one point or another, all of us have sabotaged someone else. We don't deserve the grace of God, but God gives it to us nevertheless and calls us to a different attitude, a different attitude than what's out there because what's out there is revenge. It's not easy to do in your flesh, is it? Is that easy? No. No. Our flesh seeks revenge, to get angry and to get even. But the truth is that when we face our saboteurs, we must turn the other cheek and keep moving ahead. In the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, when people try to bring us down, we must let their words of condemnation fall on deaf ears. We need to continue to focus on the mission of Christ, to pursue the dreams that the Lord Jesus Christ has placed closely in our hearts which are leading us. We must listen and not be afraid because our mission will not be completed until God says it's done. All of us. We must listen closely to what the Lord says in guidance on how to specifically handle any situation that comes our way. Oh, see, in the, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, he faced resistance on all fronts, didn't he? Not just from the pagan world. He faced trouble from the, from the Jewish world. He faced trouble within the churches that he planted because there was just different thoughts but what should or shouldn't be done. Paul tried to sew things together with the help that God gave him, and he was successful in doing so, but it was not easy. There was condemnation on him. There was destructive teachings that were being spread in the churches. There's much written about Paul's struggle with this. You look at the New Testament letters, large chunks of them are dealing with these issues. So it's not going to be a a cakewalk. Your life is not going to be a cakewalk if you want to do the right thing. There's going to be all, there's all kinds of voices out there and sometimes voices whisper into ears and sometimes people listen to those voices. Throughout the ages, every church has sincere, well-meaning Christians who leave ulcers, strained relationships and hard feelings in their wake. They don't intend to be difficult They don't consciously plot destruction or breed discontent among members. But in their stubbornness, they display an unwillingness to learn or be taught sound biblical doctrine. That's from the pages of our Bible. They don't want it. There's something in them that recoils. They want to be right. And as a result, they often undermine the ministry of the local church. 
And like the unbeliever who attempts to sabotage the work of Christ because they are living in the darkness and they dislike the light of the gospel. Sometimes well-meaning but misguided Christians who are out of step with the will of the Holy Spirit can unknowingly, the unknowingly find themselves being a catalyst by the enemy to create sabotaging in the mission of the local church. What do we do about this? How do we deal with people in this circumstance? I've been in that place. I've been a saboteur. I'll admit that. I've been a Christian for 48 years. There's been times when I've been wrong and I've done harm. I repent. I don't want to be a catalyst when the enemy whispers in my ear. I don't want to be that. Nor do you. Nor does anyone. A lot of people are well-intentioned. Church leadership. We're called to not just let poisonous attitudes and behaviors go unchecked and run their course. We're, we're called to intersect them. These attitudes need to be confronted with a desire to see repentance and unity in the body of Christ. Ultimately, we pray, asking God to help people to soften them, to change them. We love people that are having these issues. After all, God loved us when we were having those issues. So we ought to love one another and bear with one another. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. The whole love chapter explains our response. This is the way of Jesus. Ultimately, we pray for those that are doing what they're doing. And we don't permit bitterness to build up in our hearts. We have compassion. Lord, we don't know why they're doing what they're doing, but Lord, have mercy on them. Do not hold this sin against them, Lord. Right? This is the attitude that God's calling us to have. We must come to terms that people under circumstances have hidden hang-ups. Who doesn't have hidden hang-ups? We've been blinded over the years at times through wrong attitudes. Who hasn't been blinded by wrong attitudes? I believe that I've earnestly been doing right, and yet I'm resisting the Holy Spirit's guidance because it's me. I'm doing this. I'm going to do it. And nobody's going to tell me I can't. I've been there. So have you. This is part of human nature. Oh, we need to learn the grace of God. And we need to forgive those who make us their enemies. Love your enemies. Pray for them. They believe they're doing right. But only God is able to change the heart. For this reason, they are to be blessed and not cursed. Bless and do not curse. That's what the Bible says. Bless and do not curse. Turn the other cheek and move ahead. Move on. (laughs) Follow the Lord in the mission that he has for you. Listen to the voice of the Spirit. Be gentle and kind. The fruit of the Spirit is to be heavy on the branches of his servants' lives. Heavy on the branches. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Look it up. We're not going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit this morning. Look it up. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. And he wants it to be heavy on your branches. And you know what? Sometimes God needs to prune us where we need pruning so we'll bear more fruit. Right? Because he's a loving gardener. He cares for the gardens of our heart. Now, I'm in this scenario (sighs) facing this sabotage. So I want you to know, I went on my trip. I redirected to a new place. It was a wonderful week of peace and quiet. A wonderful week where I enjoyed nature. I enjoyed the birds singing and the squirrels chattering and the wildlife that I saw. No, I didn't get everything that I wanted to get for provisions. I got a deer, and that was great, and some birds. And Well, I had a moose in my, 
in my sights that was, I think, 95% sure it was legal. But there's that 5% doubt, because up where I was, you had to have a certain number of points on each antler. There's just a 5% doubt. And I thought, no, I'm not going to take, take it. I let it go. And I was disappointed. <laughs> it's 500 pounds of meat walking away. <laughs> but I let it go. It's a good thing I did. You guys, what happened in sabotage on that first incident, it had shaken my trailer and everything on my truck so violently that, you see, I have an old utility trailer that I was towing. It's not new. It's old. It's been over many bumpy roads. And I think that the frame on the utility trailer had some fractures, some hairline fractures. And this incident that I had on the highway with the trailer jackknifing and everything almost coming apart stressed those fractures to the point where, you see, I just, it was time to go home. I started traveling home. And I hit the rest stop in between Quinell and Prince George, the little lake there. You see that little pull out? There's a little lake in there. I pulled in there, tried to sleep. I couldn't sleep. Maybe it was because I was thinking, last rest stop I was at, things didn't go so well. I, anyway, I, I could not sleep, but the Lord just kept prompting me, it's time for you to get up and time for you to leave and go home. Okay, Lord. Oh, I just want another hour. I kept fighting this thought. By the time one, one o'clock in the morning rolled around, it was time. I couldn't take it any longer. It was like a compulsion. It was like, okay, God, I'll get up. I'll get on the road and I'll go home. So I got in my truck and I started driving. A few kilometers down the line, all of a sudden I felt my trailer just like... I look in my rearview mirror and my trailer is going back and forth like, a, like I was on a whip. And I'm like, oh, oh no. And I just happened to be coming up to the words, the Cottonwood River Bridge on the other side of Quinell, where there's this big deep valley and there's a bridge across the river. And then you, you continue on your way to Prince George. I'm coming south. So I, the first place that I could pull off, I pulled off. The middle of the night, 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning. So I put, put my hazard lights on, get out of my vehicle, and there's very little traffic. There's just the odd semi-truck coming through. Very dark, dark night. I go back to my trailer and I notice my, my, uh, the cord for the lights was pulled apart. And I, st I, st I looked and it looked low and I put my foot on the trailer and it went like this. I looked and the frame on that trailer, on the trailer side of the tongue, the angle that comes to your trailer hitch, okay, on the trailer side of that, the safety chains wouldn't have done any good. Completely fractured. The frame was broken in half. There was that much of a gap. And what I felt wiggling was the, the one-inch piece of steel on the other side that hadn't quite let loose yet and was kind of going like this. It was whipping it back and forth like you bend a piece of metal, right? I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh... My Lord, you knew this was broken. You provided for me so that I could safely pull off to the side of the highway in the middle of the night. Thank you for my, my Savior for saving me from disaster. If I would have had a moose on there, we would have gone many, many kilometers before that, I'm sure. So I'm looking at this, and I'm like, well, where am I? I just pulled off at the first place I could pull off. I looked. Yeah, I'm right before the Cottonwood River on the bridge, just before the bridge. And uh, there's this little, there's this little uh, road that kind of goes along side, that parallels the highway, and then kind of drops off towards the river. Like, uh, what's this? Uh, what am I going to do here? What am I going to do about all the stuff loaded in my trailer? How am I going to deal with this? Okay, Lord, you know. So I got out, got my flashlight, started looking. Where I had broken down was this place. Right before the bridge, there was about a 150 meter stretch of road leading along the top of this dike. 
And right at the end, it dipped down, and there was a little thing, and then it do dropped off to the river. So I took my flashlight and I walked down there. The first thing I noticed is there's a logging road gate, one of those yellow gates with the bell on the end of it, wide open. And there was an L shape of cement no posts, those great big highway divider things, you know, no posts. And it was like an angle and the gate was connected to these no posts and it was wide open. So I walked down this road realizing that there was absolutely nothing this road wasn't going anywhere. They must have made it to store equipment when they were building the bridge. Or maybe they store snow clearing equipment there in the winter time or something like that. Anyways, there's no traffic. So I unload my quad. I unload my canoe and my trailer and I pack them all down to this little nook at the end of this thing. And I hid them right in, in there so they weren't visible from the highway. Then I went back, I dropped my trailer I took my truck out, I took all the stuff out of my trailer, put it in my camper, loaded it up. Then, what happened was, uh, I locked this logging truck gate, and nobody was getting anywhere close to anything, because there's no way they'd get it around these no posts, because it dropped off. There's no way that anyone would get anything out of that compound, unless they actually cut that, the logging truck gate. So I left the lock on the gate, and I went home, dropped all my stuff off, got my son, got, my, got some equipment, some steel, and drills, and a gener I had everything that I needed to do an emergency repair on it, went back in the daylight, pulled in, looked. Not only was the no posts uh, there to guard people from going in and stealing the stuff that I had to leave there, but in those no posts, there's like two inch holes and I was able to put chain through the hole and come along onto my trailer frame, put my truck on the other side, and, 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 and pull this bent old twisted frame, bend it straight so that the welds that, or the places that had broken were flush with each other so I could put steel across and splint it with bolts. What a blessing! Did you know that all the way along the highway from the Alaska Highway down to home, this was the very best place that I could have broken down? I was within re arm's reach of home. Everything was okay. Nothing was destroyed. Everything was according to plan. Yes, the stress on that which broke it was as a result of sabotage. But it would have broken eventually anyways, and who knows how that would have happened. God, in his sovereignty, saw fit to see me break down there. <laughs> my trailer is fixed. I took it to the weld shop, fixed it. <laughs> Everything happened according to plan. You, my, my friends, don't mistake a side road breakdown in your life as something that shows the hand of God against you. God is for you. And everything that happens in your life, even if it seems at the time to be a destructive thing, everything works together for those, for good, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28, and we know that those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. You, as his child, are called according to his purpose. And nothing in heaven on earth and nothing that man can do, nothing that your physical body can break down and, and do, nothing that your circumstances, the things that you own, the, where moth and rust destroy and thieves break and then steal, nothing can separate you from the plan of God to have you complete the mission that he's given you to complete. And there's nothing that can interfere with that. Because God loves you and his plan is for you. You see, even if we don't see it this side of heaven, everything that happens in our life is for God's eternal good purpose to be accomplished. Both in his gospel and in you as an individual. No disaster that comes upon you. No thing that comes upon you. No sabotage that comes upon you will sidestep the purposes of God to do the right thing with your life. We can trust him. What does this mean? Don't be afraid, children of the Most High God. For if God is with you, who can be against you? 
There is nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Absolutely nothing. Neither life nor death. (laughs) No powers, no principalities. No person can interfere with what God is trying to do and accomplish in and through you. Don't be afraid, children of the Most High God. He's with you. He was with me in the midst of this trial and trouble. And as a matter of fact, I received a blessing. Because on the flip side of this, that trailer has been to some pretty remote places. And it would probably be in remote places again. The problem with that trailer was identified and is now repaired because God saw fit for me to break down. Does God see fit for you to break down? Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's a relational thing (laughs) where you're disappointed, where you're hurt so deeply that you can't, you don't think that you could ever make it any further. Well, let me tell you, the Lord has you in the palm of his hand and he will carry out his word here. All things, and that means all, work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Ah. I'm going to close with this quote by a theologian. His name is Wayne Grudem. And he defines God's providence. And I want you to pay pay, pay special attention, (laughs) special attention to what he has to say. Pay special attention to this. God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that he, number one, keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which he created them. Number two, cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinct properties to cause them to act as they do. And number three, directs them to to fulfill his purposes. This is the providence of God. And God's providence rests in your life as a true believer in Jesus. He will carry you through no matter what you're facing. His sovereignty is not cruelty. His sovereignty is loving us enough to intervene when intervention is required to serve his eternal purpose. Amen.